Okay, before I invite our distinguished guest to the stage, just a few words about how we choose the Peace Prize. I used to um, be able to tell you who had won the Peace Prize in the previous years and what the title of the, their lectures uh, had been, but uh, we're into the 15th year next year would take too long. But we did begin with Muhammad Yunus, whose uh, Peace Prize lecture would, was called Peace is Freedom from Poverty. And that will give you the notion that while we are interested in peace, we are 100 times more interested in peace with justice. And That, that leads me into explain the three simple criteria which the jury, uh, eight people from diverse walks of life, use to choose the, uh, the candidate. The first criterion has to do with a commitment to uh, peace with justice globally. In other words, it's not uh, uh, good enough to be committed to it in Woolloomooloo. Second yardstick has to do with the commitment to universal human rights, and the third criterion is about the use of the language and philosophy and practice of nonviolence. Usually when we deliberate, and it takes about three months, a theme emerges that reflects what is going on politically, socially, economically at the time. And a year ago, when we were scratching our heads about 22 uh, nominees, the issue of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the erosion of civil liberties as a result of laws being passed to reflect the concern with security became a big issue in tandem with the WikiLeaks controversy and the uh, ambivalent attitude of some powerful people to the revelations from WikiLeaks. And given those themes, of course, what emerged inevitably, and many of us thought at long last, to the top of the pile came somebody who for 50 years has been a champion of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and has challenged secrecy and censorship and in government of all kinds, has spoken truth to power and has told us the un about the undue influence of the media in manufacturing consent. That person, of course, was a distinguished social scientist, scientist of linguistics, and great champion of human rights, Noam Chomsky. At this point, I'm going to ask you to welcome Professor Chomsky to the stage, and in front of you, I'm going to explain to him why he really won the Peace Prize. Noam Chomsky. He hasn't said anything yet. <laughs> In addition to the things I've said about the three criteria at NOM, which have to do with the selection of the Peace Prize, we were obviously, uh, we obviously were completely familiar with your, your notion that, um, uh, that academics, for example, should not make a distinction between theory and practice, that you have an obligation, that we have an obligation to say what we believe in and what we stand for. And in the vernacular of, um, of uh, students, you've been one of the key people who has not only uh, talked the talk, but has also walked the walk. And uh, at a time when uh, education has become such a huge business commodity, that's incredibly, uh, incredibly important. The citation from the uh, jury refers to you inspiring the conviction of millions about a common humanity and for unfailing moral courage. And we rewarded you too for challenging secrecy and censorship uh, in government and for uh, always questioning the business of violence as a, as a piece of foreign and even of domestic policies. But we were also inspired by your ability to create hope through scholarship and activism about the attainment of universal human rights. That's what it says. It may 
That citation may, as to a language expert like you, sound a bit wordy, but it was crafted by a committee of eight people. <laughs> now, you were here in 1995, 16 years ago, to remind Australians about the human rights abuses, indeed, the genocide that was going on uh, up the road uh, in East Timor. And uh, I often thought then, I wonder if you'll ever come back to this stage. And if you did come back, all you'd have to do would be to uh, sit here and the audience would merely need to come and um, show their gratitude. But uh, you're not going to get away with that. Uh, you're, we've come to show our gratitude, but uh, it's now my great pleasure to invite you to give the 2011 City of Sydney Peace Prize Lecture. Uh, as we all know, the United Nations was founded uh, quoting its founding document, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Uh, these words can only elicit deep regret when we consider uh, how we have acted to fulfill this aspiration. Although there have been a few uh, significant successes, uh, notably in Europe. Uh, for centuries, Europe had been the most uh, violent place on earth with uh, murderous and destructive internal conflicts and the forging of a culture of war uh, that enabled Europe to uh, conquer most of the world, uh, shocking the victims who were hardly pacifists, but who were appalled by the all destructive fury of European warfare, was the words of the British military historian Geoffrey Parker. Uh, and uh, the same culture of war enabled uh, Europe, Europe to impose on its conquests what Adam Smith called the savage injustice of the Europeans, uh, England and the lead, as he did not fail to emphasize. The global conquest took a particularly horrifying form in what is sometimes called the Anglosphere, uh, that's England and its offshoots, settler colonial societies in which the indigenous uh, societies were devastated and their people dispossessed or exterminated. Uh, but since 1945, Europe has become internally the most peaceful and in many ways the most humane uh, region of the earth, which actually is the source of some of its current travail, an important topic that I will have to put aside now. Uh, in scholarship, this uh, quite dramatic transformation is often attributed to the thesis of the democratic peace, the thesis that democracies do not go to war with one another. Uh, not to be overlooked, however, is that Europeans came to realize that the next time they indulge in their a favorite pastime of uh, slaughtering one another, the game will be over. Uh, civilization has developed a means of destruction that can only be used against those who are too weak to retaliate in kind. It's a large part of the appalling history of the post-World uh, War II years. It's not that the threat of great power, the conflict has ended. Uh, US Soviet confrontations came painfully close to a virtually terminal nuclear war in ways that are shattering to contemplate if we inspect them carefully. Uh, but the threat of nuclear war uh, remains uh, all too ominously alive, uh, a matter to which I'll briefly return. Uh, can we proceed to at least limit the scourge of war? Uh, one answer is given by absolute pacifists. That includes people I respect, though I've never 
felt able to go beyond that. Uh, a somewhat more persuasive stand, I think, is that of the pacifist thinker and uh, social activist A.J. Musty, He's one of the great figures of 20th century America, in my opinion. This is what he called revolutionary pacifism. Uh, Musty uh, disdained peace, the search for peace without justice. He urged, I'm quoting him now, that one must be a revolutionary before one can be a pacifist. And by that he meant we have to cease to acquiesce so easily in evil conditions and we must deal honestly and adequately with this 90% of our problem, the violence on which the present system is based and all the evil, material and spiritual, this entails for the masses of men throughout the world. Unless we do so, he argued, there's something ludicrous and perhaps hypocritical about our concern for the 10% of the violence employed by the rebels against oppression. And that's true no matter how hideous they may be. Uh, he was confronting the hardest problem of the day for a pacifist, the question of whether to take part in the anti-fascist war. In writing about Musty's stand 45 years ago, I quoted his warning that the problem after a war is with the victor. He thinks he has just proved that war and violence pay. Who will teach him a lesson? And his observation was all too apt at that time. That was while the uh, Indochina wars were raging and on all too many other occasions uh, since then. Uh, the Allies did not fight the good war, as it's commonly called, uh, because of the awful crimes of fascism. Uh, before their attacks on Western powers, uh, fascists were treated rather sympathetically, uh, particularly uh, that admirable Italian gentleman, as uh, FDR, President Roosevelt, called Mussolini. Uh, even Hitler was regarded by the US State Department as a moderate, uh, holding off the extremists of right and left, and the British were even more sympathetic, uh, particularly the business world. Uh, Roosevelt's close confidant, Sumner Wells, reported to the president that the Munich settlement uh, that dismembered Czechoslovakia, quote him, presented the opportunity for the establishment by the nations of the world of a new world order based on justice and upon law in which the Nazi moderates would play a leading role. Uh, as late as April 1941, after the war had broken out, uh, the influential statesman George Kennan, uh, who was at the dovish extreme of the post-war planning spectrum, he wrote from his consular post in Berlin that German leaders have no wish to see other people suffer under German rule, are most anxious that their new subjects should be happy in their care, and are making important compromises uh, to ensure this benign outcome. Uh, though by then the horrendous facts of the Holocaust were well known, they scarcely entered the Nuremberg trials, uh, which focused on aggression, uh, what they called, what the tribunal called the supreme international crime, uh, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole, everything that follows the aggression in Indochina, in Iraq, uh, all too many other places where we have uh, much to contemplate. Uh, the horrifying crimes of Japanese fascism were virtually ignored in the post-war peace settlement. And Japan's aggression began exactly 80 years ago with the staged uh, Mukden incident. But for the West, it began 10 years later uh, with the attack on military bases in two U.S. possessions, uh, Pearl Harbor and Manila. Uh, India and other major Asian countries refused even to attend the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty, uh, Peace Treaty Conference because of the exclusion of Japan's crimes in Asia 
as, and also because of Washington's establishment of a major military base in conquered Okinawa, still there despite the energetic protests of the population. It's uh, useful to reflect on several aspects of the Pearl Harbor attack uh, 70 years ago. Uh, one is the reaction of uh, historian uh, Kennedy advisor uh, Arthur Schlesinger to the bombing of Baghdad in March 2003. Uh, Schlesinger recalled President Roosevelt's words when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on a date which will live in infamy. Uh, today, Schlesinger wrote, today it is we Americans who live in infamy as our government adopts the policies of imperial Japan, uh, thoughts that were barely articulated elsewhere in the mainstream and very quickly suppressed. Uh, I could find no motion, no mention of this principled stand uh, in the praise for uh, Schlesinger's accomplishments uh, when he died a few years later. We can also learn a lot about ourselves by carrying Schlesinger's lament uh, a few steps further. By today's standards, Japan's attack was justified, indeed meritorious. Uh, Japan, after all, was exercising uh, what the much lauded doctrine of uh, anticipatory self-defense when it bombed military bases in uh, Hawaii and the Philippines, two virtual US colonies, uh, and did so with reasons far more compelling than anything that Bush and Blair could conjure up when they adopted the policies of Imperial Japan uh, in 2003. Uh, Japanese leaders were well aware that B-17 flying fortresses were coming off the Boeing uh, production lines, and they could read in the American press that these killing machines would be able to burn down Tokyo, called the city of rice paper and wood houses. A November 1940 plan to bomb Tokyo and other big cities was enthusiastically received by Secretary of State Cordell Hull, and Roosevelt as well was simply delighted uh, it was reported at the plans to, quoting, to burn the industrial heart of the empire with firebomb attacks on the teeming bamboo ant heaps of Honshu and Kyushu. This was outlined by their uh, author, General uh, Chino. Uh, by July 1941, uh, the Air Corps, the Air Corps was, fly, was ferrying B-17s to the Far East for this purpose, assigning a half of all the big bombers to this region, uh, even taking them from the Atlantic sea lanes. Uh, they were to be used, if needed, to set the paper cities of Japan on fire, according to uh, General George Marshall, uh, Roosevelt's main military advisor. Uh, that was in a press briefing three weeks before Pearl Harbor. Uh, four days later, the New York Times senior correspondent Arthur Kroc reported U.S. plans to bomb Japan from Siberian and Philippine bases, uh, in which uh, the air to which the Air Force was rushing incendiary bombs intended for civilian targets, and the United States knew from decoded messages that Japan was well aware of these plans. Uh, history actually provides uh, ample evidence to support Musty's conclusion that the problem after a war is with the victor, who thinks he has just proved that war and violence pay. And the real answer to Musty's question, uh, who will teach him a lesson, can only be the domestic population uh, if they can adopt elementary moral principles. And uh, even the most uncontroversial of these principles it could have a major impact on uh, ending injustice and war. So consider uh, the principle of universality, uh, perhaps the most uh, elementary of moral principles that we apply to ourselves, 
the standards we apply to others, uh, if not more stringent ones. Now, this principle is universal, or nearly so, in three further respects. Uh, it's found in some form in every moral code. It is universally applauded in words and consistently rejected in practice. Uh, the facts are plain and they should be troublesome. Uh, the principle has a simple corollary, which suffers the same fate. We should distribute finite energies to the extent that we can influence outcomes. Uh, typically, that's on cases for which we share responsibility. Uh, we take that for granted with regard to enemies. So no one cares whether uh, Iranian intellectuals uh, join the ruling clerics in condemnation of crimes of Israel or the United States. Uh, rather, we ask what do they have to say about the crimes of their own state. Uh, we honored Soviet dissidents on the same grounds. Of course, that's not the reaction within their own societies. These dissidents are condemned as uh, anti-Soviet or supporters of the great Satan, uh, much as their counterparts here are condemned as uh, anti-American and uh, supporters of today's official enemy. And of course, punishment of those who adhere to elementary moral principles can be severe. Uh, how severe depends on the nature of the society. So in Soviet-run Czechoslovakia, for example, uh, Václav Havel was imprisoned. And at the same time, in US-run El Salvador, his counterparts had their brains blown out by a, an elite battalion fresh from renewed training at the John F. Kennedy School of Special Warfare in North Carolina, uh, acting on explicit orders of the high command, uh, which, was, which had intimate uh, relations with Washington. Uh, we all know and respect uh, Havel for his courageous resistance but who can even name the leading Latin American intellectuals, uh, Jesuit priests, who were added to the long, bloody trail of the Atacadal Brigade uh, shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, along with their housekeeper and her daughter, uh, since the orders were to leave no witnesses. Uh, before we hear that these are exceptions, we might recall a truism of uh, Latin American scholarship. It was reiterated by historian John Coatsworth in the recently published uh, Cambridge University, A History of the Cold War. Uh, he writes, uh, from 1960 to the Soviet collapse in 1990, the numbers of political prisoners, torture victims, and executions of nonviolent political dissenters in Latin America vastly exceeded those in the Soviet Union and its East European satellites. Among the executed were many religious martyrs and there were mass slaughters as well, consistently supported or even initiated by Washington. And the date 1960 is highly significant for reasons we should all know. I cannot go into them here. Well, in the West, uh, all of this has uh, disappeared, to borrow the terminology of uh, our Latin American victims. And regrettably, these are persistent features of intellectual and moral culture. We can trace them back to the earliest recorded history. And I think they richly underscore uh, Musty's injunction. Uh, if we ever hope to live up to the high ideals that we passionately proclaim and to bring the initial dream of the United Nations closer to fulfillment, uh, we should think explicitly and carefully about uh, crucial choices that have been made and continue to be made every day. Uh, not forgetting, quoting Musty again, not forgetting the violence on which the present system is based and all the evil, material and spiritual, this entails for the masses of men throughout the world. Uh, among these masses are 
for example, six million children who die every year because of lack of simple uh, medical procedures that the rich countries could uh, make available uh, within uh, statistical error in their budgets. And it includes uh, a billion people on the edge of starvation or worse, uh, but not beyond reach by any means. And we should also not forget, never forget, that our wealth derives in no small measure from the tragedy of others. That's dramatically clear in the Anglosphere. So I live, uh, for example, in a comfortable suburb of Boston. Uh, those who once lived there are, were victims of the utter extirpation of all the Indians in most populous parts of the Union by means more destructive to the Indian natives than the conduct of the conquerors of Mexico and Peru. Now that's the verdict of the first secretary of war in the newly liberated colonies, uh, General Henry Knox. Uh, they suffered the fate of that hapless race of Native Americans, which we are exterminating with such mercil merciless and perfidious cruelty among the heinous sins of this nation for which I believe God will one day bring it to judgment. Now, those are the words of the great grand strategist, uh, John Quincy Adams, the intellectual author of Manifest Destiny and the Monroe Doctrine, and that's uh, long after his own substantial contributions to these heinous sins. Uh, Australians should have no trouble adding illustrations. Uh, well, whatever the ultimate judgment of God may be, the judgment of man is far from Adams' expectations. Uh, mention a few recent cases. Uh, consider what I suppose are the two most highly regarded left liberal intellectual journals in the Anglosphere, the New York and the London reviews of books. In the former, a prominent commentator uh, recently reported what he had learned from the work of uh, uh, Edmund Morgan, uh, heroic historian Edmund Morgan, as he described him. Uh, what he learned was that uh, when Columbus and the other early explorers arrived, they found a, I'm quoting him, they found a continental vastness sparsely populated by farming and hunting people in the limitless and unspoiled world stretching from tropical jungle to the frozen north, there may have been scarcely more than a million inhabitants. Calculation is off by many tens of millions and the vastness included advanced civilizations. These are facts well known to those who choose to know decades ago. No letters appeared in response to this uh, truly colossal case of genocide denial. Hard to match. Uh, in the companion London Journal, a noted historian casually mentioned what he called the mistreatment of the Native Americans, again eliciting no comment. We would hardly accept the word mistreatment for comparable or even much lesser crimes committed by enemies. Uh, recognition of the heinous crimes uh, from which we benefit enormously would be a good start after centuries of neglect, but we can go on from there. Uh, so one of the main tribes uh, where I live was at one point the Wampanoag, who still have a small reservation uh, not too far away. Uh, their language uh, has long ago disappeared. But in a remarkable feat of scholarship and dedication to elementary human rights, the language has been reconstructed from missionary texts and uh, comparative evidence, and it now has its first native speaker in a hundred years, the little daughter of uh, Jenny Little Doe, who has become a fluent speaker of the language herself. Uh, she's a former graduate student at MIT. She worked with uh, my late friend and colleague, Kenneth Hale, one of the most 
outstanding linguists of the modern period. Uh, among his many accomplishments was his leading role in founding the study of uh, Aboriginal languages of Australia. He was also very effective in the defense of rights of indigenous people in Australia and elsewhere, and also a dedicated peace and justice activist. Uh, he was able to turn our department at MIT into a center for the study of indigenous languages and also active defense of indigenous rights in the Americas and beyond. Well, revival of the Wampanoag language has revitalized the tribe. Uh, a language is more than just words and sounds. It's the repository of culture, history, traditions, uh, the entire rich texture of human life and society. Uh, loss of a language is a serious blow, uh, not only to the community itself, uh, but also to everyone else who hopes to understand something of the nature of human beings, their capacities, their achievements. And of course, it's a loss of particular se severity uh, to those concerned with the variety and uh, uh, uniformity of human languages. It's a core component of human higher mental uh, faculties. Uh, similar achievements can be carried forward. That would be a very partial but uh, significant gesture towards repentance for uh, heinous sins on which our wealth and power rests. Uh, since we commemorate anniversaries, such as, for example, the Japanese attacks 70 years ago, uh, there are uh, several significant ones that fall right about now uh, with lessons that can serve for both enlightenment and action. I'll mention just a few. Uh, the West has just commemorated the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and what was called at the time, but no longer, the glorious invasion of Afghanistan that followed, uh, soon to be followed by the even more glorious invasion of Iraq. Uh, partial closure for 9-11 was reached uh, with the assassination of the prime suspect, Osama bin Laden, by US commandos who invaded Pakistan, uh, apprehended him, and then murdered him, uh, disposing of the corpse without autopsy. I said prime suspect. That was recalling the ancient, though long abandoned, doctrine of presumption of innocence. The current issue of the major US scholarly journal of international relations uh, features several discussions of the Nuremberg trials of some of history's worst criminals. Uh, we read there that uh, the US decision to prosecute rather than seek brutal vengeance was a victory for the American tradition of rights and a particular, a particularly American brand of legalism, punishment only for those who could be proved to be guilty through a fair trial with a panoply of procedural projections. The journal appeared right at the time of the celebration of the abandonment of this principle in a very dramatic way uh, while the global campaign of assassination of suspects and the inevitable uh, collateral damage, as it's called, uh, continues to be expanded. Uh, too much acclaim. Uh, not, to be sure, universal acclaim. So Pakistan's leading daily uh, recently published a study of the effect of drone attacks and other US terror. Uh, it found that, I'm quoting it about 80% of residents of the tribal regions, Waziristan, uh, have been affected mentally, while 60% of the people of Peshawar, main city there, are nearing to become uh, psychological patients if these problems are not addressed immediately. And they warned that the survival of our young generation is at stake. Uh, in part for these reasons, a hatred of America had already risen to phenomenal heights in Pakistan, and after the bin Laden assassination, increased still more. 
Uh, one consequence was uh, firing across the border at the bases of the U.S. occupying army in Afghanistan. Now, that provoked uh, sharp condemnation of Pakistan for their failure to cooperate in an American war that Pakistanis overwhelmingly oppose, uh, taking the same stand they did when, Pakistan, when the Russians occupied Afghanistan. Now, that stand was, of course, then lauded, uh, now condemned. Now, the specialist literature and even the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad uh, warned that pressures on Pakistan to take part in the U.S. invasion as well as U.S. attacks in Pakistan are, I'm quoting partly from WikiLeaks, uh, are destabilizing and radicalizing Pakistan, risking a geopolitical catastrophe for the United States and the world, uh, which would dwarf anything that could possibly occur in Afghanistan. Last words are quoting the British military Pakistan analyst, uh, uh, military and Pakistan analyst uh, Anatol Yevin. The assassination of bin Laden uh, greatly heightened that risk in ways that uh, remarkably were ignored in the general enthusiasm for assassination of suspects. Uh, the U.S. commandos were under orders to fight their way out if necessary. If that had happened, they surely would have had air cover uh, maybe more, in which case there might well have been a major confrontation with the Pakistani army. Now, that's the only stable institution in Pakistan. It's deeply committed to defending Pakistani sovereignty. Uh, Pakistan has a huge nu nuclear arsenal, the most rapidly expanding in the world, and the whole system is laced with uh, radical Islamists. These are products of the U.S.-Saudi uh, support for the worst of Pakistan's dictators, Zeal Haq, and his programs of radical Islamization. Now, this program, along with Pakistan's nuclear weapons, are among Ronald Reagan's legacies. Uh, Obama has now added the risk of nuclear explosions and in London and New York, which could have happened if the confrontation had led to the leakage of nuclear materials uh, to jihadis, as was plausibly feared by specialists. It's one of the many examples of the constant and often growing threat of nuclear weapons. Well, the assassination of bin Laden had a name. Uh, the name was Operation Geronimo. Now, that caused an uproar in Mexico and it was protested by the remnants of the indigenous population in the United States. Uh, but elsewhere, few seemed uh, to comprehend the significance of identifying bin Laden with the heroic Apache Indian chief who led the resistance to the invaders, you know, seeking to protect his people from the fate of that uh, hapless race that John Quincy Adams eloquently described. Uh, the imperial mentality is so profound that such matters can, cannot even be perceived. Actually, there were a few criticisms of Operation Geronimo, the name, the manner of execution, and the implications. Uh, these elicited the usual uh, furious condemnations, uh, mostly unworthy of comment, though some were instructive. The most interesting one was by the respected left liberal commentator, Matthew Iglesias. He patiently explained, I'm quoting him, that one of the main functions of the international institutional order is precisely to legitimate the use of deadly military force by Western powers. So it is amazingly naive to suggest that the United States should obey international law or other conditions that we impose on the powerless. Now, these words, incidentally, are not criticism, but applause. And it follows from them that, from them that one can raise only tactical uh, objections if the United States invades other countries, uh, murders and destroys with abandon, 
assassinate suspects at will and otherwise uh, fulfills its uh, obligations in the service of mankind. And if the traditional victims see matters somewhat differently, uh, that merely reveals their moral and intellectual backwardness. And the occasional Western critics who fail to comprehend these fundamental truths can be dismissed as silly, Iglesias explains, uh, <coughs> incidentally referring specifically to me. And uh, I cheerfully confess my guilt. Well, that's uh, 2011. Let's go back a decade to 2001. Uh, from the first moment, it was clear that the glorious invasion of uh, uh, Afghanistan was anything but that. It was undertaken with the clear understanding that it might drive several million Afghans over the edge of starvation. That's why the bombing was bitterly condemned by the aid agencies that were first forced to end the operations on which five million Afghans depended for survival was after three years of drought. Uh, fortunately, the worst did not happen, but only the most morally obtuse can fail to comprehend that actions are evaluated in terms of likely consequences, not actual ones, uh, the in, which were actual ones were bad enough. Uh, the invasion of Afghanistan was not aimed at overthrowing the brutal Taliban regime, as was later claimed. Uh, that was an afterthought uh, brought up three weeks after the bombing began. Uh, the explicit reason for the bombing was that the Taliban were unwilling to extradite bin Laden without evidence, which the U.S. refused to provide, as later learned, because it had virtually none. And the facts, uh, in fact, there's still very little evidence that could stand up uh, in an independent court of law, although his responsibility is hardly in doubt. The Taliban, in fact, did make some gestures towards extradition and we have since learned that there were other such options, but they were all dismissed in favor of violence, which has since torn the country to shreds. It's reached its highest level in a decade this year, according to the United Nations, with no diminution in sight. Uh, a very serious question, rarely asked then or since, is whether there was an alternative to violence, and there's strong evidence that there was. The 9-11 attack was sharply condemned within the jihadi movement, uh, and there were good opportunities to split it and to isolate Al-Qaeda. Uh, instead of doing that, uh, Washington and London chose to follow the script that was provided by bin Laden, uh, helping to establish his claim that the West is attacking Islam and thus, in fact, uh, provoking new waves of terror. The senior CIA analyst who was responsible for tracking Osama bin Laden from 1996, and Michael Scheuer, warned right away and has repeated since that, in his words, the United States of America remains bin Laden's only indispensable ally. Well, these are among the natural consequences of rejecting Musty's, war Musty's warning and the main thrust of his revolutionary pacifism, which should direct us to investigating the grievances that lead to violence, and when they are legitimate, as they often are, uh, to address them. And when that advice is taken, it can succeed very well. Uh, Britain's recent experiences in Northern Ireland is a good illustration. Uh, for years, London responded to IRA terror with greater violence, uh, escalating the cycle, which reached quite a bitter peak when they finally began uh, instead to attend to the grievances, which were quite real, uh, violence subsided, uh, terror has effectively disappeared. I was in Belfast in 1993. At that time, it was a war zone. I returned a year ago to a city that has tensions, but 
hardly beyond the norm. Well, there's actually a great deal more to say about uh, what we call 9-11. I should say that in Latin America, for good reasons, it's called the second 9-11, but I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but uh, there's a lot to say about 9-11 and its consequences. But I do not want to end here without mentioning uh, several more uh, anniversaries. So right now, it uh, happens to be the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's decision to escalate the conflict in South Vietnam from vicious repression, which had already killed tens of thousands of people, and finally elicited a reaction that the client regime in uh, Saigon could not control. 50 years ago, Kennedy escalated this to outright U.S. invasion, bombing by the U.S. Air Force, the use of napalm, the chemical warfare, which soon included crop destruction to deprive the resistance of food, and programs to send uh, millions of South Vietnamese to virtual concentration camps where they could be, as it was said, protected from the guerrillas who admittedly they were supporting. Well, there's no time to review the grim uh, aftermath. There should be no need to do so. Uh, the wars left three countries devastated with a toll of many millions. That's not including the miserable victims of the enormous chemical warfare assault. It includes newborn infants today, since there was genetic modification by these uh, lethal agents. Uh, there were, as was known at the time, incidentally, there were a few at the margins who objected. Uh, they were wild men in the wings, bar the term of Kennedy Johnson, National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, former Harvard dean. Uh, and by the time that the very survival of South Vietnam was in doubt, a popular protest had become quite strong. Uh, at the war's end in 1975, about 70% of the population regarded the war as fundamentally wrong and immoral, and not a mistake. Those are figures that were sustained as long as the question was asked in polls for several years. Uh, in quite revealing contrast, uh, at the dissident extreme of mainstream commentary, the war was a mistake, nothing more than that, because our noble objectives could not be achieved at a tolerable cost. It's worth noting that gap. Uh, another anniversary that should be in our minds today is the anniversary of the massacre in the uh, Santa Cruz graveyard in Dili just 20 years ago. That was the most publicized of a great many shocking atrocities during the Indonesian invasion occupation of East Timor. Uh, Australia had joined the United States in granting formal recognition to the Indonesian annexation after its virtually genocidal invasion. Uh, the US State Department explained to Congress in 1982 that Washington recognized both the Indonesian occupation and the Khmer Rouge-based democratic Kampuchea regime. The justif justification offered was that unquestionably the Khmer Rouge were more representative of the Cambodian people than Fretilin, Timorese resistance, was of the Timorese people because there had been this long continuity in Cambodia since the very beginning in 1975 when the Khmer Rouge took power. The media and commentators have been polite enough uh, to allow uh, all of this to languish in silence, uh, not an inconsiderable feat. A few months before the Santa Cruz massacre, the Foreign Minister Gareth Evans made his famous statements dismissing concerns about the murderous invasion and annexation on the grounds that the world is a pretty unfair place, littered with examples of acquisition of force, so we can therefore 
look away as uh, awesome crimes continue with uh, support by the Western powers. Actually, not quite look away, because at the same time, Evans was negotiating the robbery of East Timor's sole resource, oil, uh, with his comrade uh, uh, Ali Alatas, foreign minister of Indonesia, uh, producing what seems, the, seems to be the only official uh, Western document that recognizes East Timor as an Indonesian province. Uh, years later, uh, Evans declared that the notion we had anything to answer for, immorally or otherwise, over the way we handled the Indonesia-East Timor relationship, I absolutely reject. It's a stance that can be adopted, even respected, uh, by those who emerge victorious. In the US and Britain, the question is not even asked in polite society. Uh, it's only fair to mention that, uh, in sharp contrast, uh, much of the Australian population and much of the media were in the forefront of exposing and protesting the crimes of some of the worst of the past half century. And in 1999, when the crimes were escalating once again, they had a significant role in pressuring US President Clinton to inform the Indonesian generals in September 1999 that the game was over, at which point they immediately withdrew, allowing an Australian-led peacekeeping force to enter. Well, there are lessons here too. Uh, for the public. Uh, Clinton's orders uh, could have been delivered at any time in the preceding 25 years, terminating the crimes. Uh, actually, Clinton himself could have delivered those orders four years earlier, in October 2005, when General Suharto was welcomed in Washington as our kind of guy, in the words of the Clinton administration. And the same orders could have been given 20 years earlier when Henry Kissinger gave the green light to the Indonesian invasion and uh, UN Ambassador Daniel Patrick Moynihan expressed his pride in having rendered the United Nations utterly ineffective in any measures to deter the Indonesian invasion. He was later to be revered for his courageous defense of international law. Uh, there could hardly be a more painful illustration of the consequences of the failure to attend to Musty's lesson. And it should be added that in a shameful display of subordination to power, uh, some respected Western intellectuals have actually sunk uh, to the level of describing this disgraceful record as a stellar illustration of the humanitarian norm of right to protect. Uh, consistent with uh, Musty's revolutionary pacifism, the Sydney Peace Foundation has always emphasized peace with justice, as Stuart mentioned before. Uh, the demands of justice can remain unfulfilled long after peace has been declared. And the Santa Cruz massacre 20 years ago can serve as an illustration. Uh, one year after the massacre, the United Nations adopted the Declaration on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. The uh, declaration states that acts constituting enforced disappearance shall be considered a continuing offense as long as the perpetrators continue to conceal the fate and the whereabouts of persons who have disappeared and the facts remain unclarified. The massacre is therefore a continuing offense. The fate of the disappeared is unknown and the offenders have not been brought to justice, including those who continue to conceal the crimes of complicity and participation, all of which is only one indication of how far we must go to rise to some respectable level of civilized behavior. Thank you.
This is Big Ideas from the ABC.